Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program uh, this evening, we have Timur Husnudinov, and we have who is a uh, California cannabis industry consultant, and James Just, who is the vice chair of the Sacramento County Libertarian Party. Welcome to the show. The uh, Trump administration has now enacted or threatened to enact, I guess it will be effective by the time this goes on the air, 5% tariffs on Mexico, escalating eventually to 25% sometime around, I think it's October. If Mexico doesn't, and this is in the, uh, the, the original tweet, in all caps, stop, S-T-O-P, immigration flows to the U.S. Uh, James, uh, is Mexico going to uh, stop? <laughs> well, it's not really possible for Mexico to stop. It's, uh, it, it, you're asking Mexico to stop people from El Salvador and, and all those Central American countries from wanting to come up here. And it's just, it's not possible. We can't stop drugs, guns, or anything else to stop it. What makes us think we can stop, stop people with a tariff that's, you know, it's, you're, even if it was a good idea to begin with, it's the wrong tool. A tariff to get, to get a country to stop immigration. You, you, it's, I don't. I can't even. It's such a wrong tool. I can't even think of a way to well, describe it's, how it's, wrong it's, it's a wrong. Is. It's a wrong goal. I mean, immigration is probably. We we have a, a population in this country where there are now more people over the age of sixty five than under the age of five for the first time in uh, in recorded or well in recent in, in re memorable history. We have people my age and older who are going to be depending on lots of immigrants to pay our social security. Damn it. And uh, it's not going to happen unless we get lots of immigrants. Yeah. And that's just a fact. Yeah. We have an aging population. We have a, a dearth of working age Americans. We have a low birth rate. To think that we should be stopping people from coming here to work is absolutely wrongheaded from the very beginning. And it doesn't take away American jobs. It makes American jobs worth more in the long run. So the goal is the wrong yeah, The thing. goal is goofy. The goal is stupid. And the means, what the hell do tariffs have to do with, with immigration. immigration policy? Yeah. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> and tariffs at a 5% going up to a 25% level, there are goods that move across the border both back and forth multiple times, particularly in the auto industry, before they finally end up in the final uh, product. And Trump says Mexico pays the tariffs. B.S. We pay the tariffs. American tariff consumer. is a sales tax. That's all yeah. it is. Yeah. And consumer pays all costs. And so whether it's a tariff or a tax or a regulation, and, and this is one of the is, this is one of the worst kinds of taxes from a well, maybe not the worst, but it's a tax. It's a sales tax. Yeah. It's going to from from a progressive standpoint, it's one of the worst kinds of taxes because it will hit the consumer, particularly low income consumers, the most. Yes. Who shops at Walmart buying uh, low uh, cost goods? It's not people who are uh, you know driving uh, you know back and forth from Schenectady oh. to Connecticut. Yeah, Elon Musk and Zuckerberg don't care. Yeah, it's the people in my neighborhood that care. It, you know, it's it's when they're. It's their dish soap becomes instead of a dollar fifty, it's now a dollar seventy-five. Over the course of a year, that makes a difference. But the but the know the know nothings out in uh, Trump land uh, who believe that uh, you know the uh, the Chinese are stealing my jobs and the Mexicans are doing all this and the other, they will back tariffs and anti-immigration no matter how well we do in explaining how stupid it is. Toe the line and. But no, it's, it's an emotional, it's a, it's a visceral reaction to the other. Immigrants look different than, than we do, so they must be bad, they must be evil, they must be terrible competition. But I'm an immigrant. Well, I was going to, uh, you know, no from offense. A, from a different place, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, from Russia. That's right. Yeah, I'm surprised Russia's not on the, on the hit list. Not yet. Uh, <laughs> It'll get there. Or yeah. it was. It'll get there, yeah. It's... But, but, the, but the, 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 I mean, it's, it's just... It's so, it's, so, it's so dumb. Nobody remembers. I mean, this is a guy who has never, ever read a history book, or at least doesn't remember anything. There's a guy by the name of Smoot and another guy by the name of Holly, who back in the 1920s were trying to protect farmers from, <coughs> from tractors. Commodity prices were going down because of automation on, on the farm, basically tractors were replacing horses. And so commodity prices were going down. Smoot and Holly said it would be a really good idea to put tariffs on imported agricultural goods to protect the farmers, don't you know? Well, once that, that legislation started making its way through Congress, everybody wanted to have whatever they were doing protected. So it ended up being not only protection for agricultural goods, but for everything else. 
everything else. And of course, everybody else in the world had uh, retroactive tariffs and it turned into something we now quaintly call the Great Depression. We are looking at Great Depression number two if this nonsense continues. Yeah, if this, if this global trade war, and it's not just us, there's a global trade war going on, and, and if you do stupid things like this that aren't even involved in trade, it's going to make it even worse. But can he be impeached? Has he done anything to be impeached? No, being stupid is not According to uh, <laughs> Grand Rapids Republican Congressman Justin Amash, he says there are impeachable offenses in the Mueller report. He's the only Republican who has, uh, who has the intestinal fortitude to actually come out and say that. I haven't read the Mueller report. Justin Amash uh, has. I doubt that very many other Congress critters have. Um, is this something that uh, will actually uh, turn the tide in uh, Congress toward impeachment in any way, uh, any way, shape, or form? Well, in terms of turn the tide, no. <coughs> in terms of the Mueller report, I think we can have honorable people can get a, have honorable disagreements. I mean, different people can read the situation and say, okay, I think there's some impeachable offenses here. And I, you know, I look at the thing and I say there's an inexperienced, hot-headed president who was well served by his staff. But other people can look at the same thing and says he wanted to obstruct justice, and so that's an issue we need to look at. And I think honorable people can look at these, the issue and, dis and have an honorable disagreement about the, exactly what goes on. But also, Justin Amash isn't a typical Republican congressman. Yeah, he, these days, in, in a lot of different ways, he's more conservative than the rank-and-file conservatives in Congress, and he's certainly not a Trumpian sort of guy. Um, and, and, he's more, and he's more liberal than a lot of progressives, right, uh, depending yeah. on the issue. Yeah, I mean, he may be registered Republican, but he's a libertarian, and mm -hmm. he, has done, uh, uh, he has done things that haven't really uh, gelled well with, with the uh, people in power or his fellow uh, congressmen. And I believe Thomas Massey disagreed with his decision here, respectfully. Mm -hmm. uh, but as did uh, uh, Rand Paul. Yeah. But, you know, uh, you know, like, like James says, you can have a disagreement as right. to whether he's done anything impeachable. Is he a lunkhead? I think we all agree on that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, at, the, at best, he's an inexperienced hothead. As, <laughs> I mean, at absolute best, he's an inexperienced hothead. And I'm being kind. Well, and the thing about impeachment, I think Trump wants to be impeached because he knows damn well he's never going to get convicted in a Republican Senate. And I think if he can have impeachment be the campaign issue for 2020, he, and that along with a, an economy that doesn't go south, he wins. Yeah. Just like Bill Clinton won after he was impeached. It's, it's, it's the, the same, same thing. scenario. What are the news stories coming on right now about Nancy Pelosi wanting him to be uh, put into prison, but knowing that if they tried the impeachment round and it goes sour for the Democrats, the Democrats are going to lose even more ground than they have, and Trump is going to use it as ammunition against them. So, yeah, I don't, I don't see it happening, and I definitely don't see uh, Justin Amash uh, kind of pushing the ball forward with all of that either. Which brings up the next question, uh, which uh, deals with uh, presidential hopefuls. Uh, there are, <laughs> Bill Weld deserted the, the Libertarian Party and decided to do a, uh, a gadfly campaign uh, for the Republican nomination, going nowhere, will go nowhere probably. Uh, and uh, and the, Repo the, uh, the Democrats, you know, are rearing it, you know, jumping at the, at the bit, rearing at the bit, trying to, to uh, get nominated. There's 20 and count, 23, I think it is. Yeah, 22, 23. It's yeah, I mean, there's a lot. It's, it's hard to keep track of all of them. Uh, most of them we haven't heard of. I mean, Pete Buttigieg, Buttigieg a, a mayor from, uh, uh, from someplace in South Bend, Indiana. Yeah, South Bend. Where's, where's South Bend? I mean, uh, what, what is, and he's probably one of the best of the Democratic field, one of the, the, the least repulsive, at least. Uh, but one of the interesting things is that Justin Amash is actively being wooed by uh, certain people within the Libertarian Party to run for president as the Libertarian candidate. And uh, he hasn't said no. He said, you know, I don't take anything off the table. Any, any, uh, anything to, uh, any, any uh, hope for a white knight for the LP uh, with Justin Amash as a 2020 LP presidential candidate? Well, as I don't look for white knight LP candidates. Um, it, I would love to have them. I would love to have them come in and join the, the Libertarian Party. But in terms of a white knight candidate, it's not what I'm looking for. Um, I prefer us to build our bench and work up. But you, you take what you can get. If someone says, hey, if someone with his stature says, I want to run as a Libertarian, of course, you say, yes, let's take it, and we run with it. Because he's got the Libertarian credentials. And so it's not like, even like Bill Weld is a, is a VP, he kind of had a 
squeeze him in there. You kind of have to shoehorn him in as a libertarian. He's kind of quasi-libertarian yeah. as our VP candidate. And so when him off going to try to run as a Republican, it's kind of a shoulder shrug among yeah. libertarians. I don't think he's going to decide to run. Uh, I think he's going to take the Ron Paul approach and continue serving in his Republican role as a libertarian leader in Congress. Okay, well then the next question is, he's, get, he's got a, a, a primary, he's getting primary by a, a Trump uh, candidate uh, in Grand Rapids. And uh, who knows, he, he may lose the primary. Mm. Uh, the, you know, if he, a lot of libertarians are saying, well, if he joins the Libertarian Party now and says, I am a candidate, we'll, open, we'll greet him with open arms. Not all of them, obviously, but a lot. Other libertarians are saying if he loses his primary and then comes, uh, comes in as damaged goods to the, to the LP, maybe not, maybe not so welcome. Any truth well, to he'd that? He'd still be welcome. Anybody with that kind of experience, we can learn from. And so he would be welcome just from an experience point, just from the experience, he'd be welcome. And so, and but, but could, he be, could he beat Vermin Supreme? Yes. Oh my gosh. Well, I, I like these guys going time. out, they, they, they talk. I like no, I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying that because Vermin Supreme and Adam Kokesh, they're the you know, front runners uh, who have announced for the LP nomination so far. Kim Ruff is the other one. Kim and Ruff, yeah. Kim Ruff, I, she'd be my choice of the, of the people at the moment, but you've got Kim Ruff, Berman, um, Berman Supreme, and there's another. There's four person. or five, but. Yeah, but Berman but, Supreme's but, the one everybody knows. He somehow managed to get himself on Fox News. He, which he is, wants to give away free ponies. What can you say? Uh, how we can get ponies you know, guys, and fairy guys like, uh, um, oh, I'm, the name escapes me now. Uh, New York, the guy from New York. Um, I, he ran for governor of New York, and then the name is. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Larry, Larry Sharp, Sharp yeah. thank you very much. He, he can't get on Fox News or any of these or any of these news stations to save his life, but Vermin Supreme, with the boot on his head, can go and get on Fox News. There's something serious. There's a serious problem in our media. When well, that's, the problem's not in the media. Problem. The problem is, is, is in the credibility for the LP or the, uh, the media taking the LP seriously. Or, said another way, the LP or the, the media not wanting to do anything other than uh, Referee a horse race between Democrats and Republicans. Well, and they like that's, to because that's yeah. where all the all the all of their viewers come from. Yeah, they like they? to highlight us when the goofiness of us rather than the, the seriousness. Yeah, and it, it's not it's annoying, but it's not unexpected. Well, we don't like to talk about uh, Trump too much, but we'll talk about him one more, or at least at least a little bit more. He's meddling in British elections now. He's over, uh, you know, having tea with the Queen and and uh, so forth. But he's also dissed the mayor of London and, and uh, a couple of other people who are now going to be replacing, replacing uh, Prime Minister uh, May. Uh, any, you know, we complained when the Russians interfered with American elections. Are we not now interfering with British elections? This is different. Oh, okay. Glad you explained that. Um, seeing him being with Theresa May and uh, all of those photo shoots, and at the same time putting sl uh, snide remarks about uh, folks working within her administration and how they would do a potentially good job, and then throwing in jokes about suing European Parliament, things like that. How do you do that? How do you even? I don't. What, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's just one of the three main uh, uh, bodies of, of uh, the EU. So I don't know if that'd be the right one to sue either. Maybe the Commission yeah. instead of Parliament. Um, and what, but, court, what court hears that? I mean, mm. Go on. It's, just, it's a rhetorical question. Um, I, the, the, the Russians meddling in our elections um, and having, having uh, uh, folks kind of go undercover within the hackers that they have, it's more of a cybersecurity issue, and there has been evidence found of that. But this is more of just kind of uh, Trump's version of tongue-in-cheek, but also kind of serious commentary while, while doing all of the parade and show-like things, visiting with the administrations and... In the UK, so I don't I don't take it very seriously, but maybe some of the front runners there would. Now we know that that uh, Trump is a uh, uh, an avowed uh, uh, non-drinker. He he you know he's a teetotaler. So they say. Yeah uh, yeah. But I'm wondering if he has been visiting Oakland, where they have now decriminalized magic mushrooms. <laughs> well, magic mushrooms wouldn't fall into the drinking. Uh, uh, side of things, but it isn't just magic mushrooms. They they actually Denver in this in this last month um, uh, decriminalize psilocybin, uh, which is the magic mushrooms, right? But but Oakland took it a step further and they decriminalized all entheogens, which is all psychoactive, mind-altering substance of the same category, um, 
like fungi, uh, that would create spiritual or developmental experiences, uh, more of a more more of a structural kind of uh, nature rather than recreational. That's why the term entheogen was created, uh, not to just get high and to see different things and to trip out, as they say, but to have spiritual experiences uh, like the shamans or uh, people like taking peyote, spirit quests, sweat lodges, that kind of stuff. And there is a rising amount of evidence uh, in scientific literature showing that there is some benefit to these things. Um, I, I forget who it was, but recently a, a, a professor of, of, and a researcher of one of these studies uh, showed that potentially there's greater benefits to taking, uh, maybe microdosing or, or standard dosing of entheogens than cannabis, but also greater risks. Um, uh, I, I, will, I will not confirm nor deny personal experience with um, psilocybin or like substances, but I, I can tell you that uh, it, can, it can certainly lead to dangerous situations, but then again, overall, um, having it illegal and uh, punishable and, and, and a crime doesn't really help anybody. Yeah, well, we, that definitely leads to uh, dangerous absolutely. situations like absolutely. jail and, and uh, cages absolutely. and, and uh, handcuffs and but that the, sort of thing. The Oakland City Council strongly <clears throat> cautioned and recommended folks uh, who are considering of using these things for the right spiritual purposes and developmental purposes to have a guide, to have uh, people knowledgeable about this sort of stuff. Not to just take it, <coughs> go down to the, the middle of downtown and uh, run across the streets into traffic. That's definitely not the goal. Well, Den yeah, Denver and Oakland both have, they haven't uh, legalized it so, or decriminalized it so much as they, as they have said. It is now the very lowest uh, priority for p police enforcement. In other words, stay away. Uh, cops, don't bother with this because we're not going to bring a case, even if you make the arrest, more or less. Right. Uh, well, you know, and that's, that's sort of like making it, uh, making it, making it unpunishable. Still against the law, but not punishable. Right. I, I, you know, why don't they just get honest and say, let's, you know, let's legalize it? Maybe they will eventually. I know a lot I guess of folks. It's a step in the in, right direction. In, yeah, the, a lot of folks that I've worked with uh, in the cannabis industry, who, and generally overall in the the war against the drug war, mm -hmm. um, uh, see the ultimate goal as legalizing everything. Um, and the next stage of the legalization and decriminalization process after cannabis would be things like magic mushrooms. Uh, so it looks like certainly the the progressive toe on that end is is uh, is working its way in. And I definitely encourage more cities to to at least experiment with this sort of policy. Well, is Oakland going to be a trailblazer as far as California is concerned? Is this something that California will be uh, seeing more of as time goes by? Probably. Where, mean, where, where would you see the, the, the next effort being made? Uh, well, I, based off of uh, uh, past history with uh, certain banned substances, maybe uh, the area surrounding Marin County, um, there, are, there are some successful and ongoing experiments that they've been doing with uh, MDMA. Um, and which is which is on the ban list federally, right? But the DA actually authorized them to do these these uh, experiments, these these supervised tests for treating PTSD and other serious ailments, microdosing and uh, normal dosing and other kinds of um, intake. And it's showing a lot of promise, a lot of promise, and potentially curing people of some of these ailments. So that could be down the road as well, uh, guided uh, experiences with magic mushrooms and other like substances expanding the mind and curing one's ailments. So certainly there's other localities, maybe San Francisco would be another one. Well, it's interesting. I mean, we hear, uh, we have the FDA, which of course uh, regulates all uh, pharmaceutically, uh, pharmaceutical company produced drugs. Mm -hmm. And the standard is not only does it have to be safe, it has to be proven safe, it has to be proven effective. <laughs> uh, and uh, when you're talking about cannabis uh, and magic mushrooms and all of the rest, uh, none of the, or very little, uh, 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 you know, scientific double-blind tests have been done on any of these substances that I'm aware of, or at least they're not published. Uh, that's part of the ban. Exactly. They can't be. Uh, and if, if that's the case, uh, is this kind of the, you know, the Wild West, the, you know, the new frontier in non-federally uh, FDA-regulated medicine, and, uh, and is that a good thing? I think it is a good thing overall. Uh, I mean, states are supposed to be... Uh, labs for experiments with this sort of stuff. Uh, and we see that the success of cannabis decriminalization and legalization across the country in the majority of the states is, sh is showing to be effective, both monetarily speaking, but also in reducing a lot of the harms on the war that the war on drugs has caused. Uh, so this would be the natural next step. And if localities, if cities and maybe counties in California want to continue this, this experiment, and it could spread to the entire state, and maybe we'll see the same sort of effect as we saw with cannabis throughout the country.
We talked about the uh, the tariffs uh, being uh, threatened against Mexico. Uh, of course, the uh, the big tariff story has for a very long time been uh, tariffs against China. And one of the reasons or one of the rationales given for tariffs is that those Chinese have been stealing our technology uh, for you know for decades now. The Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers I E E E uh, banned, and I understand now has rescinded the ban Correct. Uh, against uh, Huawei employees from publishing or being involved in peer review of search papers. Uh, tell us about what's going on with Huawei. So this is just one article and one story in a long line that's going back to the start of 2018 and even before then. Um, if you were to look at the timeline and the calendar for, for these developments, it's, it's uh, almost something out of like a, uh, a novel. What's, what's happening. Um, there's concerns about the, the company stealing um, trade information and giving it to the Chinese government and using it for its own purposes. There is uh, uh, back doors that have been found in the software. The hardware, uh, primarily involving 4G and 5G tech, is being uh, scrutinized heavily and the U.S. is condemning other countries in Europe and across the world for uh, adopting these these standards, even though places as recently as Russia, uh, they allowed uh, Huawei to essentially issue the 5G licenses and to start building out the infrastructure. So it's it's kind of on a teeter totter right now. Some days we have stories about greater bans and greater restraints against Huawei, and other days we have ones about uh, them uh, opening it up. Uh, I know recently um, one of Huawei's executives spoke about having the uh, desire and interest in signing a no spy deal with the U.S which is certainly interesting, because the FBI has, has run a couple of stings, at least two stings, even at a CES, uh, Electronics Trade Show recently, against Huawei. Well, the, one of the, 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 I think the daughter of the founder and CE, uh, chief CFO, uh, CFO uh, was arrested in Vancouver uh, and extradited to the United States uh, for uh, who knows what. Uh, is, this, that, is, that is that still, is, is she still uh, uh, in detention? As far as I know, uh, uh, yeah, well, actually, I believe there was a $10 million bail granted um, for their release, but the extradition was uh, authorized. Uh, I know that the, the trade secrets part of the issue <coughs> trial just began on June 4th in Texas. So there's different states and different countries that are doing different things with Huawei. It's a really confusing cluster of events. Um, and perhaps there is some truth to the, to the spying allegations. Um, but however, uh, as uh, folks have said before, that the quality and the, the sophistication of the hardware and the software is truly something to behold. And pretty soon, Huawei, if, is not, if they're not impeded by these kinds of restrictions, could become the number one supplier of smartphone tech and, and the like, even laptops, things like that. Um, so it's interesting to see such a visceral response from a lot of countries, especially in the West, against them. Uh, it definitely has a air of non-competition, but, but there is something to be said about uh, China's interest in using uh, large multinational companies like Huawei. Is Huawei, yeah, is Huawei uh, a, uh, well, all, all Chinese companies are pretty much controlled by the government, but is it also owned by the government, in, in the, or is it a private company? It's supposed to be a private company. But w with significant government ownership, right. I'm I mean, who, how can we really say? To, who, to, to who be knows? Sure. Yes. Are they going to release that information, or are they going to admit to what they took or what they didn't take? I don't think so. Um, but it's it's certainly a, a, a protracted battle that's, been, like I said, has been going on for two years, and is certainly going to go into the 2020s. Do we have? Do, are are U.S. Uh, uh, companies matching the 5G uh, sophistication of, of Huawei? Not really. So no. we stand to lose in the uh, technical battle to go 5G, which, I, as I understand it, uh, speeds up your smartphone uh, phone, you know, and download a, something or another in you know, milliseconds as opposed to minutes, right. so, among other things, so we among, have, uh, including we, the Internet of Things. We've been, we've been rolling out 5G here for a little while now, but most of it is fake 5G uh, or glorified 4G. Um, because the, there are no 5G uh, phones so far. There are, there are. Uh, there's one model from Samsung, okay. but it's retroactively a 5G, meaning that in a couple of years it will have its full functionality. But new phones are released every single year, uh, especially flagship devices. Speaking of which, when Samsung <clears throat> released its uh, dual screen foldable phone, Huawei beat them to the punch and, and released a, a more superior version. I believe it was called the Mate Pro X. Um, and having these sorts of bans and discussions could potentially remove Huawei as a player with superior hardware and software technology in markets like the U.S. 
Um, I know Apple has been suffering in, in iPhone sales in China, uh, but there's definitely more adoption of Huawei products in the East than there is in the West. Well, I mean, China is, after all, some, some somewhat bigger, you know, larger, four somewhat. and a half times larger it's, market than the U.S. It's a desired market, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, <clears throat> but even Apple is struggling with some technolo technological developments, and Huawei has proposed selling its 5G tech and other circuits to Apple. Uh, we don't know the answer or the conclusion to that discussion yet, but it's certainly going to get more interesting. I hope we pick this topic back up in the future. Well, yeah. uh, it's going it's to be around for a while. Yeah, yeah this, whole, the, this whole Chinese spying, and, and st it's been going on for decades, and because in order for a U.S. company to... I mean, we say that as if, we, as if the CIA hasn't spying Oh, we spy, we spy on every... We spy on the whole world. There used to be that... that um, every single phone spy conversation. Spy versus spy cartoon. I yes. Mean, in Mad Magazine. Yeah. I mean, it's been going on for... You know, well, forever. Yeah, I think the United States spies on like every phone conversation on the planet, essentially. I don't think we have the sophistication or the resources to do that, really. Or well, I, I, think, think, I, think we, I think we actually I think do. We do. I, I think I don't we think a person do. actually sits and there. I think we've got so I don't think a person. Now, no, but they have the, the search, the the search tools to find whatever probably, you want. Probably. Yeah. So, yeah. They, can, they can scan it and they can go back and, and they can check. You know, they don't actually actively do it. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. I have a t-shirt that says NSA, the only agency that actually listens to the people. <laughs> we have we have a, a little bit of time left. Let's talk about AB five, the anti gig worker bill. What? Uh, how, how bad is it, and will it pass? Well, for people like me who like to work as independent contractors, it's a terrible bill. For people who want to have uh, regular employment, they already have those options. So. I'm not, it's one of those bills where they wanted to do something with Uber and Lyft. Because Uber and Lyft, they keep continuing to mess with the payment algorithms for their drivers. And the drivers have no recourse at all. You just have to accept it or not work for them. And so they wanted to do something with that. And so there's a general, there's a genuine issue there. But for some reason, they decided to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so, so people who want a part-time job or want the freedom to pick and choose which days they work without having to report to a boss or ask somebody, hey, I need this time off, you just don't work that day or don't work that period of the year. Day. Yeah. Or, no, you, you know. can't get the job period yeah. because, because it's now an employee payroll job and, and there's not going to be nearly as many of them. Yeah, or, or you end up working for conditions you don't want to work under. I do a lot of work for Amazon deliveries. And so if I want to do Amazon deliveries after this thing, I might have to get one of the van driver jobs, which are 10-hour shifts, and you have to and they have work very hard, and then you have and so you and you're working on somebody else's schedule. I'm like now, or I get up in the morning, I look and say, no, I'm not working for that price. And so I make them wait, and then I say, okay, now they've offered 25 bucks an hour. So I'll, okay, I'll, I'll go work for 25 bucks an hour. It's essentially freedom versus security. Yes, um, chains and, versus freedom, yes. and and employment versus unemployment is, is the ultimate uh, result. That's the show. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place on the Libertarian Counterpoint, www.accesssacramento.org on your uh, internet and on your television.